multivariable calculus. We're in section 13.3, day two, and you can look at the top of the screen. We've got three learning targets. I can find normal and binormal vectors, and then I can write an equation for normalize, normal and osculating planes, and finally I can write an equation for an osculating circle or circles. So let's get some definitions here. At a given point on a smooth space curve, r of t, that vector function, there are infinitely many vectors. In fact, we could say just not many, but infinitely many vectors that are orthogonal or perpendicular to the unit tangent vector. And on the notes from 13.2, we proved that the derivative of a constant length vector it says constant vector, but I want to change that to constant length vector. That means the length is always the same, but the direction could change. That's very important. If it's set a constant vector, that's implying that the direction and the length are always the same. So we need to change that and clean it up. Constant le length vector is orthogonal uh, to uh, the constant length vector. So a derivative of a constant length vector is orthogonal to the constant vector. So look at this. If I took the length of the constant vector uh, of uh, the tangent vector, it's 1. t prime is orthogonal, but of course t prime is not necessarily a unit vector itself. If you wanted to make that a unit vector, you'd divide by its length. And that's what we get right here for this definition. The principal normal unit vector is uh, t prime all over the length of t prime. And uh, very importantly, you can see right here, I have two stars. Uh, the unit uh, tangent vector t points in the direction that the curve is moving. Uh, but this normal vector, also a unit vector, length of 1, points in the direction that the curve is turning. And, uh, of course, you could look over here off to the right. If you have a curve, uh, you know, you can, of course, have your unit tangent vector. That's indicating the direction that the curve is moving. Uh, and then, of course, this uh, normal vector would point in the direction that the curve is turning. Uh, but now we're going to get another definition, the binormal vector. The binormal vector is the cross product of the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. And uh, the cross product, you might remember the right-hand rule that we've talked about. Uh, the right-hand rule, you can see uh, as we're looking off to the side here again, You've got your uh, tangent vector and your normal vector. Uh, when it's t cross n, it's a t turning towards n. Uh, you can imagine that the pinky of your right hand is placed on t turning towards a uh, vector n. Your thumb would point up. That would be your binormal vector. Uh, it's also going to be perpendicular uh, to t and n by the definition of a cross product. Uh, but we're also saying that this binormal vector b is a unit vector. Well, let me quickly prove that to you. Uh, if you looked at the length of a cross product, you might remember uh, from chapter 12 that it was the length of a multiplied to the length of b times the sine of the angle between them. Well, the thing is, this tangent vector, unit tangent vector, and unit normal vector both have a length of 1. And of course, uh, we know that the angle between the tangent and the normal would be 90. Uh, and uh, that would be uh, a 1 also. So this length would be a 1. All right, so let's go ahead and quickly jump in and find uh, the unit normal and binormal vectors of this problem, of this, of this circular helix. Uh, so tell you what, I'm going to rewrite this and just say r is in component form. We could say, well, we've got the cosine of t, uh, the sine of t, and we could say that we've got t right here. Well, we could find r prime very quickly. Our prime of t would be uh, the negative sine of t, 
comma the cosine of t comma one and by the way if we wanted to find the length of that vector of course we just do the norm if we had our calculator but just want to show you that it, you're really just doing the Pythagorean theorem in 3d uh, and I do want to point out that you'd have sine squared plus cosine squared inside which is a 1 and 1 plus this 1 squared would be a 2 so it won't take you too long to see that the length of uh, our prime is going to be radical 2 well the tangent vector the unit tangent vector t is going to be r prime divided by its length right here and uh, you know you could see that we had negative sine of t cosine of t and one and then we're dividing that by root two you could even say well that's a one over root two you could keep that constant out in front and there you have it you've got negative sine of t cosine of t comma one now could you distribute that inside well of course you could well let's go ahead and take our derivative of t here's t prime and we could keep our constant out in front and uh, the derivative of negative sine well that's negative cosine the derivative of cosine is negative sine or the opposite of sine and the derivative of this one is a zero and uh, let's just say you wanted to find the length of this vector right here and forgive me when I'm coming back up here uh, you know I believe I said the correct wording about uh, this thing right here I forgot to put the length around it so we, we should put you know absolute value around that well if I put the absolute value around t prime well you get the idea if you distribute that one over radical 2 in there uh, you'd get negative cosine of t all over radical 2 and if you square that plus here you'd have negative sine of t all over radical 2 squared uh, plus a zero squared which of course isn't going to do anything uh, but uh, look you really have cosine squared over 2 and sine squared over 2 and I guess I'm not going to do a lot of simplifying in, in this regard you know uh, it, when you've got this right here you could certainly factor out a one-half and then you'd have cosine squared plus sine squared which is just a one so you just would have a one-half inside the square root and uh, that's going to be one over radical two okay once you simplify it. so right now we know that's the length of our uh, t prime so the normal vector the normal vector is going to be t prime of t divided by its length we want to guarantee it has a length of one in other words uh, so we've got this 1 over root 2, negative cosine of t, negative sine of t, 0. And uh, down below, we just saw that its length is 1 over root 2. Well, you know, nicely, you can now say that our unit normal vector is just negative cosine of t, negative sine of t, 0. So that's kind of nice where we've got this answer right here that's you know finding your normal vector well what about your binormal vector well your binormal vector is plain and simply t cross n and uh, you could 100 percent do this on your calculator in fact that's not a bad thing to do whatsoever however just want to point something out it's always good to review some properties if you are doing uh, you know k a constant times a vector cross another vector we saw in chapter 12 that you could pull that constant out in front and just do the cross product of a and b and then you'd have the constant out uh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is that when you're looking at t especially you're gonna see you've got this one over a root two 
And, uh, you know, that's kind of like your K. So you could do the cross product distributing that one over root two in, or you could just pull it out in front. And uh, regardless, you're going to get the right answer. Now, just helping you out, uh, what would it look like typing it into the calculator? Well, you know, the, you type in under the catalog cross product, and then let's just say that you were taking your vector t here and you did distribute that in. You could do that with or without uh, putting that radical 2 inside. But what would it look like step by step if you did type that out? Well, it would look something like this. Uh, you know, here's your vector t. And then you'd have to close your bracket, put a comma. Then you'd have vector n, which is just negative cosine of t, negative sine of t, comma, zero. And then very importantly, you got to close your parentheses. That's how you type it in. Or you could have left this one over root two out and just put it in at the very end. Regardless, you'd get the same answer. I, I do think it's easier to leave it out. Uh, leave that one over root two out in front. And then you could uh, distribute it in later if you wanted to. Or you could very simply just t write out what I had uh written up above on the line above where I'm writing now get the same answer and it would be this this is your binormal vector so that's page one let's jump over to page two and as we're looking at page two just want to tell you uh, we've got some more definitions we're gonna have definitions about planes and uh, you know, with these planes here, it says the plane determined by the normal and binormal vectors uh, is called the normal plane. Uh, so what that's going to look like is if we were to, to draw a, a plane, we'd have our normal vector, we'd have our binormal vector, those two vectors would be on the plane or contained inside. That means that the tangent vector would be orthogonal. You're always dealing with three vectors with planes in these problems. That's so important for you to understand. Uh, the tangent vector, t, the unit tangent vector, the unit normal vector, and the binormal vector are always related to this plane. In the normal plane, the normal vector and binormal vector are inside the plane. They're resting on it. That means T points up. It's orthogonal. Now you can think, why is that so important? Well, very importantly, you might remember that when you've got an orthogonal vector to the plane, that would be your vector ABC, which when we're writing the equation of a plane, we just need a point. And we'd have uh, those components, A, B, and C, in front of X minus X naught, uh, Y minus Y naught, and Z minus Z naught. And you have all of that set equal to zero. So that's very important. If you're asked to write the equation of a normal vector, uh, it's the tangent vector, T, uh, that would be like your A, B, C. Likewise, you could also have what's called an osculating plane. Now, the osculating plane has vector t and vector n resting inside of the plane. They're resting on the plane. That means that uh, what we're going to have is the binormal vector. The binormal vector is going to be orthogonal. It's going to be uh, making the right angle. And that means your binormal vector would be like this green vector right here, ABC. So the osculating plane is the plane that comes closest to the part of the curve near P. So, uh, you know, we're going to piggyback on that and then say just as you can have an osculating plane, you can have an osculating circle. The circle that lies in the osculating plane is called the 
osculating circle and we're going to have to pick this up in the next video as we're wrapping up here.